Have you ever heard the phrase, you never get a second chance to make a good first impression? Yeah? It turns out that that saying is absolutely true. Studies after studies have confirmed that this is called the primacy effect. And what it means is that once a first impression is made, everything you do gets filtered through that first impression. So if you make a good one, you have the cards stacked in your favor. If you make a bad one, it's not impossible to overcome, but you have a mountain to climb. So essentially, you only get one chance to make a good first impression. You better get it right the first time. So how long do you think you have to make a good first impression? What do you think? 10 seconds. 10 seconds? You wish. <laughs> how long? Two seconds. MIT study confirmed by the Harvard School of Health Sciences. In two seconds, people will judge your level of success, education, your social status, your friendliness, your trustworthiness. Why? Why is it that across cultures, across hemispheres, people will judge you that fast? Where does this come from? Instinct, survival instinct. Now, our instincts have about a 100,000-year lag time on our environment. Our reflexes are still those of hunter-gatherer times. And back in those days, you often only had two seconds to decide if the shape coming into your field of vision was animate or inanimate, human or non-human, friend or foe. Basically, fight, flight, or relax. And those who could make those split-second decisions accurately survived, thrived, multiplied, and produced us. And those who couldn't ended up as somebody else's crunchy protein snack. <laughs> Today, we're still operating on hunter-gatherer instinct. What happens in those two seconds? You walk into a room, what do people look at? Fight or flight? What this means is that what they're thinking is if we were to meet in a dark alley, who'd win in a fight? Then we move into friend or foe. And this, remember, is tribal times, right? How do they determine if you're friend or foe? What do they look at? Your eyes. Your eyes. What are the eyes? How many of you are thinking the windows to the soul? <laughs> It's actually absolutely true, because the area around the eyes is the most mobile of the entire human face, thus the most expressive, which is why poker players wear sunglasses, which is why Onassis used to also wear sunglasses when he was negotiating shipping contracts so that his opponents could not see what he was thinking. So, the eyes, what else? Tribal times, right? Friend or foe? Your smile, your face, yeah, your body language. Did you know that over 80% of your interactions come down to your body language? MIT concluded after extensive studies they could predict the outcome of negotiations, sales calls, and business plan pitches with over 87% accuracy without listening to a single word or tactic or argument only looking at the voice fluctuation, the listening ratio, and the body language of the participants. Thing is, there is far too much body language for you to control consciously. Trying to control your body language consciously would be impossible. We're sending out thousands of information, units of information per minute. Even if you try to control the main expression on your face consciously, sooner or later, what's called a micro-expression will flash across your face. And here's the thing, people will catch that. Because people can read your face as fast as 17 milliseconds. And if there's something that doesn't quite fit, they'll get the impression on a gut level of a mixed message, at best. At worst, they'll get the impression that you're being inauthentic. Not good. So what do you do? 
In Hollywood, it's called method acting. In sports, it's called visualization. And 86% of American Olympic athletes use this tool. You're going to get a chance to try it out for yourselves in a very quick visualization. Could you please turn towards your neighbor? Take a good look at them. Good look and close your eyes. All right. So close your eyes. Face them, not me. Face them. You have a good idea of what they look like? You remember their eyes? Okay. Now, I want you to imagine, since you're trying to pass the friend or foe test, that this is a really good friend. Taste the s'mores that you ate together. <laughs> Hear the songs that you sung really, really badly off key. More than everything else, feel the warm emotions rising. This is a really good friend. You're so happy they're here. Open your eyes, shake their hand, go! Okay. I promise you'll get a chance to talk to your new best friends again. Why does this work? Because there's an interesting quirk about the subconscious mind. It does not distinguish between imagination and reality. How many of you have already been scared watching a scary movie? Raise your hand. Now, consciously, you knew that those are just well-paid actors on screen who are delighted to look like they're getting murder in exchange for a couple of million dollars. But subconsciously, your brain sees blood and guts up there, and it sends you straight into fight-or-flight mode, adrenaline rushing through your system. Do me a favor, close your eyes for a second. Imagine a lemon. Taste the difference between lemon and lime. Feel the sourness on your tongue. Now, think of your favorite piece of music. Hear the opening bars. Now, imagine dragging your fingernails across the chalkboard. Open your eyes. There was no lemon. There was no chalkboard. All there was was your imagination, and yet, your body produced very real reactions to a completely imaginary event. This is a visualization. And you can use this any time you want to pass a friend or foe test. Now, body language in friend or foe, right? What next do they look at in first impressions? How do they determine if you're of their tribe? <coughs> Dress, right? Clothing is nothing but tribal wear. IBM used to tell its people, you can wear anything you want as long as it's a white shirt, red tie, and a navy blue suit. American Express had a stroke of genius when it decided that on college campuses, all its salespeople would be dressed like college students, and then they went one step further. They didn't just dress them like college students, they hired college students. So you're in your tribal wear. You've made an amazing first impression. You walk up to them and what happens next? You shake hands. Why do we shake hands? Why is it that across cultures, across hemispheres, we tend to shake or to show the right hand. That's where the knife is. To show that the weapon hand is unarmed. Which is why, in various times in history, lefties couldn't be trusted. Because <laughs> they could shake with their left and stab with their right. And in certain periods of time, left-handed people were actually put to death. How many of you in this room are left-handed? You are lucky to be alive. <laughs> now, before I tell you what a good handshake is, what's a bad handshake? A dead fish. Angle. 
Keep your palms straight, thumb up. No dominant handshake, no submissive handshake, no two-handed politician's handshake. <laughs> Grip, always match their level of firmness. I do not care if it's a man or a woman that you're facing. Match their level of firmness. About two, three seconds, depending on the culture, Release their hand and let them go. <laughs> so, you've made the perfect first impression. What next? In the flow of interactions with people, you speak. Conversation. Conversation skills are not a question of wit, wisdom, or wordplay. They all boil down to one thing attitude. And the attitude you want to have is that the person you are facing is the most fascinating human being you have ever met. Disraeli's genius was in making everyone he was speaking to feel intelligent and interesting. I always tell my clients, don't try to impress them. Let them impress you, and they will love you for it. Dale Carnegie used to say in 1926, you can make more friends in two months by becoming truly interested in other people than you can in two years by trying to get other people interested in you. Which living politician is a master at this? Bill Clinton. I've met hardened Republicans who told me, Bill Clinton, I hated him before I met him. I hated him after I met him. But while I met him, man, I love the man. <laughs> How can you get that magic? How can you get that presence? Think of Clinton. Does he need to say a word? No. The secret to a great presence is that great presence. It's being truly, completely present in your interactions. Have you ever been in a conversation when half your brain was busy doing something else? Like preparing your next sen sentence or thinking about something completely different? Have you ever been in that situation? When that happens, there's a good chance that your facial expressions are going to be a split second delayed, and the effect, the perceived effect of delayed facial expressions, is that you come across as inauthentic. Have you ever been in a conversation with someone you felt was being fake, inauthentic? You do not want to come across that way. So think of that in your interactions when you're meeting amazing people over the next two days. Remember to keep bringing yourself back. Bring back your full attention because remember, you've got to be fully present. You've got to be really listening. And don't just listen. Listen with presence. You can't fake it because if you do, split second, they'll realize it. The one thing that really you have to focus on is you can have amazing, heartfelt connections with people if you really give it a chance. Give them your best. Thank you very much.